guys. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode four of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Today, I talked to Judy Tyler. I talked to her about her distinguished career. Now, Judy served in the FBI for 31 years. One of the most interesting things about her career in law enforcement actually happened before she became an agent. She talks about being one of the first women to join the Norfolk, Virginia Police Department. She talks about how she was recruited and how that led to her uh, coming into the FBI. It's really pretty interesting to think about uh, women in law enforcement wearing a uniform back in the uh, early to mid 70s. And she shares that with us. She also talks about um, the dangerous drug world. Uh, She talks about some of the very interesting and exciting cases, um, again, dangerous cases, that she was either the lead case agent or worked on a drug squad as a team effort in combating drugs. She also talks about her post-retirement career, training current agents in the FBI, how to develop informants. And both of us talk about how this is a very crucial and important skill set for agents to have. Before I get into my interview with Judy, just want to mention just a few things. Uh, First of all, because we talk a lot about the early days of women in the FBI, just wanted to let you know where we stand now. Uh, As of now, the FBI has approximately 13,907 agents, and of those, 19%, 2,707 are female agents. Another exciting thing is that this year, the FBI, after years of budget cuts, will be hiring more agents. I talked to the Uh, applicant coordinator and recruiter at the Philadelphia office, and they tell me that the FBI is looking to bring on board an additional 700 agents in 2016. So if you're interested um, in applying for uh, the agent position, I do have a link to the jobs website for the FBI at jerrywilliams.com. Law enforcement is a rewarding career for men and women And I highly recommend it. Talking about law enforcement, I'm going to move over into uh, the crime fiction, true crime segment of this show and talk to you about something that I would like your feedback on. I really enjoy the show Shades of Blue. That's the one with Jennifer Lopez and with Ray Liotta. But yesterday, as I was watching it, it comes on every Thursday night on NBC, I started to feel uncomfortable because the police corruption and the brutality that is shown on that show is very exciting, very entertaining, suspenseful. But I'm wondering if the timing for that show is wrong. I mean, we have so much in the news today um, it, you know, we have uh, Black Lives Matter, we have Blue Lives Matter, we have All Lives Matter, and to have a show which sensationalizes police corruption and brutality at this time, I, I just don't know. And then it hit me uh, last night when I watched the show, and I won't uh, spoil everything for those who haven't seen it, but it kind of went over the top when it came to some actions that uh, the head of the squad, uh, Lieutenant Wozniak, took. And I'm thinking, again, is the timing right for this show? And is there a possibility that this show could make public perception of policing worse? Love to hear your thoughts on that. All right, well, I think it's time now to move on with the show and talk to Judy Tyler. Okay, everyone. I am absolutely excited to introduce my guest to you for today, Judy Tyler. Hi, Judy. Hi, Jerry. Thank you for uh, coming on the show. 
I think this is going to be a great show because you've had an exciting career um, with, uh, you know, cases that uh, that you see in movies and see on TV, but you work the real thing. So uh, why don't we get started by first telling a little bit about your background, how you got into the FBI and a little bit about your career then maybe we'll talk a little bit about what you're doing now that you're retired, and then we'll get really deep into one of those exciting cases that I teased a little bit there. Okay. I um, studied uh, criminology at Old Dominion University. It was the first years that they were having that as a uh, field of study, but it still hadn't come into its own as a major yet. So it was and Old Dominion is in Norfolk, Virginia. Yes, and uh, when I graduated from college, um, I had had a burglary occurred at a house I was living in, and the police responded, and one of them asked what I was going to do when I uh, got out of school, and I told him I was majoring in criminal justice, and he suggested applying to the Norfolk Police Department because they were just starting to hire women. And uh, my first response was I didn't want to get beat up every night. And he said, it's not like that. And so I did. I applied. What what was your initial plan? So you were studying uh, what became criminal justice, but you weren't initially going to become a police officer? Well, there weren't women police officers at that time. Wait, what what, what year is this? This is 1975. Okay. And uh, so I thought I'd go into probation or more traditional female roles in law enforcement. And Which, when, of course, is what I did. I, <laughs> I, I was know. A juvenile, you were in yeah, a neighboring a ju- town. That's right. Our, As a juvenile careers, probation officer. Yeah, our careers paralleled each other to a degree. Yes, that's true. Um, so... He suggested I apply to the police department. I did and was hired uh, and put in uniform and went to the police academy. And it was really terrific experience. And the best way I could describe it was the education of being in the front row of the movie theater of life uh, as a kid. Um, So I spent three years on patrol and Norfolk is a military town, so we would have an aircraft carrier come in with 5,000 guys who would then descend all over town, and uh, things would get pretty active. So, um, after- can, I, can I stop you for a minute? How sure. many women, since this is the very beginning of women uh, being allowed to uh, join the Norfolk Police Department, how many women were in your class, and how many women were in the total uh, department when you first started? There were, I believe, two in my class for the Norfolk Police Department. Um, one, and there was also a park ranger in the academy also at the time. Um, I, I believe it was two. And I'm not sure how many women were on the department when I joined, but it was minimal. Um, you just never saw them. And uh, it actually worked to my advantage when I became a police officer because you go into a bar fight and the guys just stop and stare because they'd never seen a woman in uniform, a police uniform before. Cool, cool. All right, so now you have this uh, person that suggests that you become a Norfolk police officer. Now, how did you get from there into the FBI? Well, um I, my fourth year on the police department, I was a I became a detective and I handled sexual assault cases. And I realized then that I really liked working a case from the very beginning to the end and taking it through the court system. So then um, I saw an article in the Parade magazine about women in the FBI in 1977 and thought I might be a good fit. So I applied for the job and uh, was hired in 1979. There was a hiring freeze when I first applied. And uh, so I came in in December of 1979 after five years on the Norfolk Police Department. All right. And uh, so what was your first office of assignment? I went back to the Norfolk field office 
and I was assigned to bank robberies and fugitives and some applicant work. And uh, the office was right downtown Norfolk. And so for eight months, I worked uh, those violations. And one of the most exciting uh, cases that happened as a brand-new agent was a kidnapping of a baby that uh, I got to fly and pick up the kidnapped baby and fly home with it to present the baby to the mother at the airport. Where was the baby? Where was the baby found? Uh, the baby was in California. It actually was a girl who pretended she was pregnant for her boyfriend in prison, and she took this baby and uh, pretended it was hers. And we found indented writing of a letter in her house, and that's how we figured out what had happened with the baby. That's uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, introduction into the FDI. That's your, that's your first year. Yes. All right, so then from Norfolk, you were there for eight months? Yes. And then where'd you go? I went to Philadelphia in December of 1980 and was assigned to a squad that investigated property theft and crimes, burglary gangs, and uh, eventually that squad became a drug squad when the FBI got jurisdiction to investigate drugs along with the EA. Okay, what year was that? Do you remember? That would have been about 1982. So I guess for the first two years, I did property crimes, and then we became the drug squad. And I stayed there for the rest of my career. Wow. Why don't we skip ahead just a little. Okay. And talk about what you're doing now, because I think that's pretty interesting, too. And then we'll go back and talk about some of the cases that you worked uh, during your time your long time on the uh, drug squad. So what are you doing now? All right. I retired in July of 2010, and the first job I got in retirement was at the Little Shop in Haddonfield, New Jersey, which is a quilt store. We sell fabric. Yeah, I think people will find that uh, really uh, interesting that you went from working drugs, you know, um, arresting and, and, and putting drug dealers in jail to working in the quilt shop? Well, I have to say I began quilting 20 years before I retired so that my hobby then morphed into a job when I retired. So um, from the outside, it might look like an abrupt change, but quilting was always part of my life uh, during the Bureau. And I know you were in a quilting group with a number of female agents. What what was the name of that uh, group? It's called the Needle and Gun Club. And the name of the group came one day after firearms when Linda Vesey, Delia Kane, and I had finished shooting. And Delia said, come see the quilt I brought. She opened her trunk, and there was a beautiful eagle she had appliqued on a piece of fabric, and that's when I said, we ought to call it the Needle and Gun Club because it's the tools of our two trades. And everybody liked that name, so it stuck. And now you have a second uh, post-retirement uh, job. Tell us a little bit what, what you can uh, about that job. Well, I work as a contractor providing instruction for the FBI, um, sometimes at the FBI Academy. I'll be going there next week. And sometimes it's at another location in Virginia for agents on um, developing and operating informants. And what do you do? Now, that, that sounds pretty interesting. What is it that you do during this class, during this course? Well, uh, I can't really talk about a lot of it, but part of it is done in role play, which is a great way to teach. It's a teaching method where it's better that the students make mistakes on me than the public. Um, so they maybe interview me and try and figure out my motivations and things like that. And I can teach in roles so that they get it. And uh, it's a great way to teach. And I don't know if... Um the listeners understand that developing informants or human intelligence sources is very, very key to the FBI because that's how, that's one of the tools, one of the many tools that we use to gather information, to gather intelligence. Yes, I, I 
would say that's the cornerstone of every case in the FBI. Every single case is made with uh, information from the public, and I'd say that's probably the most important skill to have to be able to work with people. And I know it was when uh, I retired, and I retired about uh, uh, seven, eight years ago, um, every agent was required and expected to develop informant. I take it that's still the uh, the case. Yes, that hasn't changed. Um, as I said, that's really the bread and butter of our jobs. Any case that is a success has informant uh, a component to it. All right. Uh, and I would imagine that the reason that you were selected uh, to have this job, to be hired for this job, is because during your years working drug investigations, that was a very important of your day-to-day existence and success, developing informants, getting these drug dealers and their uh, associates to talk to you. It was probably one of the most enjoyable aspects of the job, truthfully, um, working with uh, the people in the public, whether they were drug dealers or not, um, to put together a case. Now, you have a case. Um that really talks about informant development and the connection that you, you know, grow between you and the people cooperating on the investigations. Um, it has a sad outcome, but let's uh, let's just talk first about the case itself. Um, well, the last case that I uh, worked with in the FBI was. The last six months of my job was about a four-month death penalty trial um, that involved uh, the killing of a federal witness and her nephew. There were a number of people that went to trial um, for this murder, uh, in addition to the drug dealing. Uh, Maurice Phillips was the main target of the investigation, and he hired his cousin to come up and pose as a FedEx delivery man and uh, went to the victim's house to give her a FedEx package and killed her and her nephew who happened to be there fixing her computer at the time. And why did they do this? The woman uh, had, we had, the FBI, our squad had searched her house because she was a money launderer. Uh, and making up false records for a number of drug dealers uh, and purchasing assets for them in fake names. So it was a joint case with the FBI and the IRS that went on, the investigation went on for over about a 10-year period. And I was not the investigating agent during the uh, investigation. I I participated with that search of the house of the money launderer and a couple of other things, but uh, I was assigned after it was indicted and took it to trial, along with a team of other people. This case no, has- now why was that? So, who was the case agent for the for most of the investigation? Well, I would say Mike Parmigiani began it. Kathy Downs took it through indictment, and then she transferred out of the division, and. I was assigned it after it was indicted and scheduled to go to trial. And and that's oh. a difficult thing as an agent to pick up somebody else's case that you don't know intimately. Okay, so you became involved in the case when the last case agent was transferred and reassigned to another division. Yeah, she took a, a country a assignment out of the country for a year and a half. All right, so now this means that you have all of these files, and I would imagine this is a multi, multi volume case file. And so you're going to have to go through all of these files and really absorb everything that happened in that case. So as you talk with the prosecutors and develop a strategy for the trial, you are going to be able to put your finger on key testimony, key evidence, key uh, wires, if there were any uh, recordings. Um, So you really have to learn this case as if you were on it from the very beginning. Yes. And when I was told that I was assigned to the case, I felt a little bit like Nadia Suleiman, the woman that was pregnant with seven babies at the time, 
Um, that's a good analogy. I like that. That's exactly how I felt. But uh, Overwhelmed? Yeah, because this was a 10-year investigation, and um, I really didn't know that much about it. But um, but I learned it, and uh, I learned how to better prepare cases for trial, too, through going through this experience. Unfortunately, it was at the end of my career. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tell me a little bit more about the woman and her nephew uh, who had been killed. This was, I take it, a murder-for-hire type situation? Yes. She, uh, after our search, had agreed to cooperate with the FBI, and um, the defendant, Maurice uh, Maurice Phillips, found out about it, and uh, so he hired his cousin in Tennessee to fly in and to do the hit and leave and he made sure he had an alibi that he was paying his taxes at the moment that the um, murder happened and his the tax payment office is next to the police department so there were police officers who were his alibi witness that saw him so we knew he didn't actually pull the trigger. And how much did he pay? Uh, his, you said it was his own cousin who, who he paid to kill this, uh, this informant? Yes. Well, I don't think that he really got paid in full what he was promised. It wasn't that much money. Um, but, uh, at the end of the day, he's the one that confessed to it, and that's how we found out how it happened. Now, how did you, identify the cousin who lives in Tennessee as the shooter. I mean, I take you, you, you said he came into town this job and then left. How right. were you able so, to identify him? It was many years later that he got caught on another case down in Tennessee and he proffered, which is making a statement where what you say can't be held against you. And in that statement, he confessed to having done this murder because he figured sooner or later he'd get caught. So his statement came in under a proffer protected agreement. Wow. Yeah. He did plead guilty and get 10 years for the murder. Um, Ultimately, there was some accountability, but it's like having to make the deal with the devil in order to get Maurice Phillips. And what did Maurice Phillips get? You said it was a four-month trial? The total time, I believe, was four months because in a death penalty trial, there's a whole separate penalty phase that lasts a week or two. Um, So he was convicted of the killings, and then in the death penalty phase, all 12 jurors have to agree, and we had one holdout. So he got life instead of the death penalty. All right. I'm sure you've worked on uh, many cases. What's one of your best cases that uh, you could share with us today? I would say uh, the case that took place down in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, We had an undercover agent into a pizza parlor, uh, Scotto's Pizza, And uh, the undercover agent began buying cocaine uh, from the owner of the pizza parlor, parlor, and um, ultimately he became a cooperating witness and agreed to have his business wired up for recording meetings with mob guys that came down from New York when they would sit and discuss their drug business. And uh, we successfully had another undercover agent introduced to him when the original case agent went to the country of Colombia to adopt a child. So she was out of the picture, and we sent a uh, postcard, had her send a postcard to the subject from the country of Colombia, explaining that she was no longer involved and successfully got uh, another agent introduced to take over her drug business. The the other agent, was that Jesse Coleman? Yes. You know what? This is so funny because I actually, I don't know if you remember this, but there was one time that Jesse had to go down to this pizza parlor and they wanted a backup, and I was his armed backup. 
Oh, that's Do you great. remember that's that? That's the case. That's the case, yeah. Yes, yes. How about I actually that? um sat in the car and, you know, kept my eye on Jesse while he was in the pizza pla uh pizza place. But yeah, I was his backup for that. You know, they didn't want to send a another uh, a male agent. They thought it would be too suspicious. So mm -hmm. they had me. Jesse is an African American agent. So they had me pose as his girlfriend or wife or something that went down with him and sat in the car. Um, but yeah, I was there as his backup. So oh, I can't wait to hear more about this case because I don't remember the details. Well, it, it's very exciting. So. We got the Bureau to authorize the purchase of a pound of heroin for $120,000. And so Jesse negotiated this purchase, and some of the mob guys from New York came down with the pound of heroin, had him meet in a shopping center to get the drugs, and then come back to the pizza parlor to pick up the money. So we had another undercover agent in the pizza parlor with the money, and when they all regrouped for the transfer of the money, in comes yours truly as the FBI with a search warrant, and we search it and treat everybody, including Jesse and the other undercover, as subjects, and we seize back our own money. Meanwhile, Jesse has the heroin in the trunk of his car, and, of course, that's kept separate. They don't know that he's undercover. Jesse was able to successfully... Uh, maintain his undercover status and negotiate payments that I still owe you this money. Once I sell the drugs, I'll pay you in increments. But we need, you know, I don't think it's good that we all be seen together again. So send some other people to pick up the money. And so we would have turnpike meetings to turn over ten or 15000 as payment on that debt. So you would meet on the New Jersey turnpike, what, at a rest stop or something? Mm-hmm, at rest stops. And Jesse would record his conversations, and we would photograph the transfer of the money. And uh, they ultimately trusted Jesse so much, they brought him up to New York, and we negotiated another uh, purchase of heroin up in New York and uh, identified all the people involved. And it was the Sicilian Mafia bringing in heroin from Sicily uh, into the U.S., and the case ultimately culminated with a uh, transfer of cocaine and uh, down to a Wilmington rest stop where many of the people involved acted as escorts for the drugs on the way down, and they, they were armed. So when we did the final takedown, we recovered several weapons, and that's when we introduced Jesse as an undercover agent to the subject who was in such disbelief. He said, I thought you were a brother. That's pretty cool. We had a so, number of trials in Wilmington on it, and uh, we had the New York mob attorneys come down. It was an interesting uh, case. And what was the outcome? Uh, how many uh, uh, people were actually uh, convicted, and what kind of time did they get? They got very long sentences. Um, let's see, probably six or seven, but I, I will say the head of it was in his 70s, had never been arrested, Faro Bartolotta, and he was arrested in Sicily, hiding under his bed with a newspaper article about him being a fugitive in his pocket by the Italian authorities for us. So it would be kind of hard for him to try to pretend that uh, they had he gotten the wrong guy. Right, and that he didn't know he was wanted. So he came back and stood trial, and a number of them died in prison because they were old when this happened. So I think they got 20 to 30-year sentences, and he was in his 70s at the time of his arrest. Judy, do you have any uh, newspaper articles or anything like that that we would be able to you know, read and, and, and uh, give a little bit more detail about this case? Yes, I have a lot of newspaper articles about this. Okay, and great. Why don't you send those to me, and I will put them on jerrywilliams.com with a link, you know, uh, to the article so that people can, uh, if they're interested, uh, learn a little bit more about this case and, and, and some of the, you know, subjects involved. Okay. All right, great. Okay. Is there, uh, uh, that case is, it's, is pretty cool and the, uh, it's amazing that they had a, a little teeny tiny role in it, but, uh, it does bring back some memories. 
So, Judy, we've talked about, uh, you know, two cases now um, that, you know, were fascinating cases. Is, is there any other case that you want to talk about or just briefly um, go over with us? Well, I had one very interesting case towards the end that was uh, transferred to um, another incoming agent as I was leaving, and that was a group of guys called the Ugly Squad. They named themselves that. And um, were they ugly? Well, I'll leave or that there, in the. Uh, <laughs> or was or was their behavior ugly? It was the behavior. But the great thing with this case, it, I worked jointly with the Philadelphia Narcotics Division on this, and they brought me into it. Um, they had seized a lot of kilos of cocaine, seventeen weapons, and there were three six foot alligators in the basement of the house uh, where they did Come the again. search warrant. What? I said, what? <laughs> yes. They had to call and get the alligators removed. There were Cayman alligators and American alligators. And um, Were they pets? Yes, but they would, like, feed them live animals. And I, I imagine it's an intimidating thing if you uh, came across them. These guys had developed their own logo uh, for the Ugly Squad, um, a U with an S that kind of looks like a dollar sign, and they put it in the tattoos on the handle of their guns, tattooed on their bodies. Then they also were big in graffiti, and they would tag their graffiti with years. So I went around the city taking photos of their graffiti, show the existence of the group through all the years from their graffiti for the trial. Is there a particular section of Philadelphia that they operated in? Yeah, I would say the Bridesburg, just sort of north of Kensington, up uh, off of 95, uh, that area. And so uh, we had a fugitive who ultimately, when he was arrested, it erupted into a shootout. He took off and hit a police officer and then a citizen as pedestrian and then slammed his vehicle into a customer's car who was arriving at a garage for an oil service. And so I was present for the arrest, and and, and the only reason he stopped was because he was shot. He got shot. I was right behind my partner who we, we worked a task force, so there were Philadelphia police on my squad. And uh, so uh, they were a very dangerous group of guys, and so... Um, he was hospitalized. He was shot five times but survived and uh, ultimately pled guilty and was sentenced. One of the most interesting things was um, a very astute nurse noticed he was being excessively modest. And at the beginning of her shift, she did a thorough check of him and found two cell phones, one secreted in his butt cheeks and the other one also in the crotch area, hidden. And so she recovered the cell phones. I got a search warrant for those phones and um, ultimately got all the contents out of it. But uh, the magistrate that issued the search warrant, it was I, he was a new magistrate, and it was his first search warrant. And um, I think he enjoyed reading that affidavit. So when you say that he was modest, that means that when she was trying to to maybe give him a sponge bath or change his dressing, he didn't want her to see or touch different areas of his body. Yes. Okay, yes. and that's how she got. She became suspicious that maybe he was actually hiding something. Yes, and he was. And uh, the police ended up, the SWAT team had to move him from the hospital to the prison hospital because he was an escape threat. Um. And ultimately, I went up and got DNA swabs from him at the prison, and uh, he eventually he pled guilty. He didn't go to trial. And uh, do you recall how many, uh, what kind of time he got? I believe it was twenty some years. Uh, another agent took over uh, that case when I retired to see it through its conclusion. And do you think there's any newspaper articles on that? Case two? Yes. All right. So I'm going to um, also link, uh, have the links to articles about that particular case, and I'll have them on jerrywilliams.com. So if anybody wants to come and, and read a little bit more about that case, and I guess the shootout will probably be in the article too. 
All right, Judy. So, wow, you had a very exciting career. I mean, we touched on three cases that you were actively involved in, are the case agent for. And uh, we also talked about, you know, what led up to your career and, and, and uh, you know, what you're doing now. Is there anything that we uh, haven't touched on that you'd like to, uh, to talk about before we, we, uh, we stop? Um, I will mention this one thing. Um, when I was on the Norfolk Police Department uh, as a sex crimes detective, one of my very first cases was a 12-year-old girl who claimed her uncle had raped her. And uh, her uncle had a sexual assault history. And so he was charged. And the farther I investigated it, I realized the physical evidence didn't add up to her statement. And when confronted, discovered that she she was 12 years old and pregnant by a boyfriend and made that story up to cover her pregnancy. And that one incident that happened in my very first case taught me a very valuable lesson about being a thorough investigator and going where the evidence takes you and not necessarily based on what people say um, unless they match up. So, so her uncle could have been ended up in jail as a sex offender based on false accusations. Absolutely. And so it was your thoroughness that was able to um, prevent that from happening. I, I realized at that moment how important the whole picture is and to really look at the physical evidence to support any statements. And here's the example. She said that the rape had occurred in a very muddy area. When his car was seized, there was no mud in the um, tire tread, and that just didn't add up. So ultimately, a good interview got to the bottom of it. Well, that must have been a very uh, satisfying case for you, for you to realize, to really know for sure that, you know, you're looking for, I, I guess, that, that, that old uh, cliche. You're looking for, for just the facts, you know, yes. just the facts, yes. and yes. and not taking uh, personal opinions or conclusions, um, you know, based on you know just what somebody told you. You're actually looking at the facts and analyzing uh, the case and the statements and the evidence. Yes, and it really shook me up the thought that somebody innocent could have gone to jail for what she had said. And I guess that was that form the basis of all of your investigations from that point on. It did. It made me a better investigator. That's a perfect ending right there. Okay. We'll end right there. And that's the end of the show. Don't forget that photos and links to newspaper articles related to this interview can be found at jerrywilliams.com. Today's episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Reviews with Jerry Williams. Thank you.